Welcome to my garden. Gingy Good Earth programs. Your host, Gretchen Schmidt. Who are these fellas? They're the Younger Brothers, the Border Outlaws, Jesse and Frank James, their Comrades in Crime by J.W. Burrell, published 1881 in St. Louis, the Younger Brothers, and also it looks like uh, Cole Younger and Jim Younger and Bob Younger. That's the famous story of Jesse James. This is a book that I'll be reading in the near future. But today I'm reading A Universal History of the United States of America, and I'm on page 48. I'll also will be reading a book on Daniel Boone, Wilderness Scout. He was born and raised in Kentucky. So we'll read that too. And I have to finish the book on the Vikings. And I will be reading White Buffalo Spirit, word from word. I co-authored and I had uh, done all the photography for that book. So I would like to get that book read too. So we have some future events that'll take us right through the winter probably at the end of this film footage i'll be reading about ike's farewell to churchill the general mourns my old friend january 30th 1965 and at the end of this reading on a universal history of the united states of america i'll finish up with that and again, welcome to my garden. And we have to go for a quote of the day. The best way to cheer yourself up is to try to cheer somebody else up. Mark Twain. So, without further ado, we'll get on with the reading. I have to wear a flashlight on my forehead because the words in the book is so antiquated it has to flash down on the book. So, page 48, and I'll go back one uh, paragraph. Captain Mason landed his men and marched just at night to the plantation of Canicavis. Again, that was the rendezvous point, which appointed to be the place of general rendezvous. That night there arrived an Indian runner in the camp with a letter from Captain Patrick, who had arrived with his party at Mr. Williams' plantation in Providence. Captain Patrick signified his desire that Captain Mason would wait until he could join him. Upon deliberation, it was determined not to wait. Though a junction was greatly desired, the men had already been detained much longer than was agreeable to their wishes. When they had absolutely resolved the preceding day to march the next morning, the Indians insisted that they were but in jest, that Englishmen talked too much but would not fight. It was therefore feared that any delay would have a bad effect upon them. It was also suspected that if they did not proceed immediately, they should be discovered. So I'm going to focus this in more on the picture show so you can see the pictures better. Okay. It was also suspected that if they did not proceed immediately, they should be discovered, as there were a number of squaws who maintained 
and intercourse between the Pequot and the Narragansett Indians. The ar army therefore consisted of 77 Englishmen, 60 Mohican and River Indians, and about 200 Narragansetts marched on Wednesday morning and that day reached the eastern Nahantic about 18 or 20 miles from the place of the rendezvous the night before. This was a frontier to the Pequots and was the seat of one of the Naragan set Sachems. Here the army halted at the close of the day, but the Sachem and his Indians conducted themselves in a haughty manner towards the English and would not suffer them to enter within their fort. Captain Mason, therefore, placed a strong guard around the fort, and as the Indians would not suffer him to enter it, he determined that none of them should come out, knowing that the perfidy of the Indians and that it was customary among them to suffer the nearest relatives of their greatest enemies to reside with them. He judged it necessary to prevent their discovering him to the enemy. In the morning, a considerable number of Mayatonahmo's men came on and joined the English. This encouraged many of the Nahantics also to join them. They soon formed a circle and made protestations how gallantly they would fight and what numbers they would kill. When the army marched the next morning, the captain had with him nearly 500 Indians. He marched 12 miles to the ford in the Pocantuck River. The day was very hot, and the men, through the great heat and a scarcity of provisions, began to faint. The army, therefore, made a considerable halt, and refreshed themselves, made at the bank of the river. Here the Narakansant Indians began to manifest their dread of the Pequots, and to inquire of Captain Mason with great anxiety what were his real designs. He assured them, that it was his design to attack the Pequots in their forts. At this they appeared to be panic-struck and filled with amazement. Many of them drew off and returned to Narankonset. The army marched on about three miles and came to Indian corn fields, and the captain, imagining that he drew near the enemy, made a halt. He called his guides and counsel and demanded of the Indians how far it was to the forts. They represented that it was 12 miles to Sakakis Fort, and that both forts were in a manner impregnable. Welquash, a Pequot captain, or petty Sakam, who had revolted from Seskos to the Narakinsets, was the principal guide, and he proved faithful. He gave such information respecting the distance of the forts from each other and the distance with which they were then at from the chief Sackham's has determined him and his officers to alter the resolution with they had be for adopted of attacking them both at once and to make a united attack upon that at Mystic. He found his men so fatigued in marching through a pathless wilderness with their provisions, arms, and ammunition, and so affected with the heat that this resolution appeared to be absolutely necessary. One of the captain's underhills men became lame at the same time and began to fell. The army, therefore, 
proceeded directly to Mystic, and continuing their march, came to a small swamp between two hills, just at the disappearing of the daylight. The officers, supposing that they were now near the fort, pitched their little camp between or near two large rocks and Groton, since called Porter's Rocks. The men were faint and weary, and though the rocks were their pillows, their rest was sweet. The guards and the sentinels were considerably advanced in the front of the army, and heard the enemy singing at the fort, who continued their rejoicings even until midnight. They had seen the vessels pass the harbor some days before, and had concluded that the English were afraid, and had not courage to attack them. They were therefore rejoicing, singing, dancing, insulting them, and wearying themselves on this account. The night was serene, and towards the morning the moon shone clear. The important crisis was now to come, when the very existence of Connecticut under Providence was to be determined by the sword in a single action, and to be decided by the good conduct of less than eighty brave men. The Indians, who remained, were now sorely dismayed, and though at first they had led the van and boasted of great feats, yet were now all fallen back in the rear. About two hours before day the men were roused with the exceptions, briefly commending themselves and their cause to God, advanced immediately towards the fort. After a march of about two miles, they came to the foot of a large hill, where a fine country opened before them, the captain supposing that the fort could not be far distant, sent for the Indians in the rear to come up. Uncas and Weequash at the length appeared. He demanded of them where the fort was. They answered on the top of the hill. He demanded of them where were the other Indians. They answered that they were much afraid. The captain sent to them not to fly, but to surround the fort at any distance they pleased and see whether Englishmen would fight. The day was nearly draw dawning, and no time was to be lost. The men pressed on in two divisions, Captain Mason in the northeastern and Captain Underhill to the western entrance, as the object which they had been so long sinking came into view, and while they reflected they were to fight not only for themselves, but for their parents, wives, children, and the whole colony. The martial spirit kindred in their bosoms, and they were wonderfully animated. As Captain Mason advanced with a rod or two of the fort, a dog barked, and an Indian roared out, Owanox, Owanox, that is Englishmen, Englishmen. The troops pressed on, and as the Indians were rallying, poured in upon them through the Palados Pilati dose of general discharge of their muskets, and then wheeling off to the principal entrance, entered the fort, sword in hand, notwithstanding the suddenness of the attack. The blaze and the thunder of their arms, the enemy made a manly and desperate resistance. Captain Mason and his party drove the Indians in the main streets towards the west part of the fort, where some bold men who had forced their way met them and made such a slaughter among them that the street was soon clear of the enemy. They secreted themselves in and behind their wigwams, and taking advantage of every covert maintained an abstinent de defense. The captain and his men entered the wigwams, 
where they were beset with many Indians who took every advantage to shoot them and lay hands upon them so that it was with a great difficulty that they could defend themselves with their swords. After a severe conflict in which many of the Indians were slain, some of the English killed and others sorely wounded, the victory still hung in suspense. The captain, finding himself much exhausted and out of breath, as well as his men, be the extraordinary exertions which they had made in this critical state of action, had recourse to successful expedite. He cries out to his men, We must burn them. He immediately entered a wigwam, took fire, and put it into the mats with which the wigwams were covered. The fire instantly kindling spread with such violence that all the Indian houses were soon wrapped in fr flames, and as the fire increased, the English retired without the fort and compassed it on every side. Uncas and his Indians, with such of the Nagra consets as yet remained, took courage from the example of the English and formed another circle in the rear of them. The enemy were now seized with astonishment and forced by flames from their lurking places into open light became a fair mark for the English soldiers. Some climbed the palisades and were instantly brought down by the fire of the English muskets. Others, desperately sailing forth from their burning cells, were shot or cut in pieces with the sword. Such terror fell upon them in that they would run back from the English into the very flames. Great numbers perished in the conflagration. The greatness and violence of the fire, the reflection of the light, the flashing and roar of the arms, the shrieks and the yellings of the men, women, and children in the fort, and the shoutings of the Indians without just at the dawning of the morning, exhibited a grand, awful scene. In a little more than an hour, this whole work of destruction was finished. Seventy wigwams were burnt and five or six hundred Indians perished, either by the sword or in the flames. A hundred and fifty warriors had been sent on the evening before, who that for very morning were to have gone forth against the English. Of course, in all who belonged to the fort, seven only escaped, and seven were made prisoners. It had been previously concluded not to burn the fort." but to destroy the enemy and take the plunder. And the captain afterwards found it the only expedient to obtain the victory and save his men. Thus parents and children and Sinep and Squaw, the old man and babe, perished in promiscuous ruin. Though the victory was complete, yet the army were in great danger and distress. The men had been exceedingly fatigued by the heat and long marches through.